So I want to talk a little bit about crawfish first. <laughs> Stay with me. Now, you guys remember I'm, I'm a proud Texan, and in Texas we eat a lot of crawfish. So I tried to do a little research to determine if Michiganders know about crawfish. And I learned that you call them crayfish. <laughs> I also learned that they are considered an invasive species and they're clogging up the lakes and ponds. Did you guys know they're edible? I think I found a solution to your problem. <laughs> Hello, you're welcome, Michigan. <laughs> for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, a crawfish is a small freshwater crustacean, about this big, that looks like a tiny lobster. They got tiny little pinchers and a tail that's about half their body. Now, I assume, say, I hope that I'm safe in saying that we can all say we know what a crab is. Yes, one of our girls. Okay. Also crustaceans, much bigger, different body shape. So here's what's interesting about crabs and crawfish. Okay, if you put a single crab in a bucket, it climbs out because it has long pinchers so they can do that. If you put a bunch of crabs in a bucket, nobody gets out because when one starts to climb out, the others reach out and reach up and pull it down. <laughs> That's how they treat each other. <laughs> but crawfish, on the other hand, you put a single crawfish on a bucket, well, I can't get out because they're little and it's stuck. But if you put a bunch of crawfish into a bucket, they make a chain up the side of the bucket and back down the net sergeant of the bucket. <laughs> yes, up the side, back down the outside of the bucket. They all get out by making a chain holding onto each other's tails. That's how they do. I've seen this in a maybe that has to be in grocery stores in the South in March. It's, it's hilarious. It's just overrun with crawfish. Just, <laughs> yes. The crabs keep each other down. The crawfish help each other out. Literally. And this is my favorite illustration of universalist theology. It so clearly demonstrates how we can create heaven and hell with how we treat each other. I'm mostly going to be speaking in the past tense, but there are still universalists and different kinds of universalists. They do still exist, but mostly we'll be speaking in the past tense. Universalists believe that Jesus had redeemed all souls in hell and then had sealed it so that no one else would ever go to hell. And all people, regardless of when, where, or how they had lived, were saved through that action. Salvation was universal. Hence the name Universalists. Now they believed in sin, had a theology of sin and punishment still, but they believed that sins were accounted for in this lifetime rather than in an afterlife. They were influenced heavily by reason and science, who believed strongly in cause and effect. They concluded that a wrong committed in this lifetime logically created a debt that would be owed in this lifetime. And this is where we find the main schism in universalist theology. What about people who didn't know what they did was wrong? Or something bad happened to them, they have no idea why it is happening to them. What about people who die before they can pay their debt? What about people who simply refuse to be held accountable in this lifetime? If the common destiny that awaits us all is heaven, then what of those who leave earth with a debt unpaid? The answer to these questions created two schools within universalism. We'll start with the ultra-universalists. We refuse to accept that anything could separate humans from the love of God. They believed that sin was finite and that salvation was infinite. And they believed that the love of God would reconcile all of our earthly actions. Their teachings, and this is my favorite, were called death and glory. <laughs> Meaning that no matter who you were, or what you had done, the second you died, you entered heaven. Do not pass go, do not collect $200, go straight to free parking forever. <laughs> Their heyday was in the early 19th century in Massachusetts. And arguably, the most prominent ultra-universalist was Hosea Ballou. 
There's an anecdote that is told about Hosea Ballou that helps to illustrate ultra-universalism. The story goes that he was visiting a small town. He was staying in the home of a man who had accepted his, his ideas, but his wife was not convinced. Hosea Ballou was sitting at the kitchen table while the wife was cleaning for the Sabbath. And she asked, possibly out of the corner of her mouth, that he really believed that all people would be saved just as they are. And when he said that he did, she allegedly went, <laughs> and kept on cleaning. <laughs> the story goes that Baloo asked her what she was holding, and she said, a mop. And he said, and what do you use it for? And she said, to, to clean the floor. And he said, and will you clean the floor just as it is? And she said, yeah, I, I, I mop the floor as it is to clean it. And Baloo said, ah, so you do not require it to be made clean before you will consent to mop it up. Likewise, God saves souls to purify them. That is what salvation is for. God does not require men to be pure in order that they may be saved. For Baloo and other ultra-universalists, salvation had already been granted to everyone without exception, without any exception at all. Death and glory. The other type of universalism is restorationist universalism, which was popular in the late 19th century and the first half of the 20th century across the country. Like the ultra-universalists, restorationists believe, unlike, unlike, the big difference between them was that ultra-universalists believed that you went straight to heaven, restorationists believed in a, a situation like purgatory. They thought that after death, you might go to an in-between place in order for your soul to be rehabilitated before entering heaven. Yeah. Charles Skinner, who we heard from in our first reading, was a restorationist universalist. <clears throat> Here we find a very different version of universalism than what was presented by Ballou. The restorationist universalist really emphasized the importance of character development and rehabilitation. We get into the, uh, the old debate here of salvation by faith or salvation by works. I promise I'm not going to talk about it too much. But I think it's interesting, Joe, though, just to note that the universalists existed because they came up with a third solution here. Instead of salvation by faith or salvation by works, they believed in salvation through character development. <clears throat> this is how they solved the question of how people from other faiths and no faith at all were included in their program of salvation. It's what modern Christians call the Gandhi question. Can Gandhi be in hell? No. <laughs> the Restorationist Universalists believed that salvation was extended to all, but that God and humanity still needed to be reconciled. The Ultra-Universalists believed that all of that reconciliation work was done by God. The Restorationists believed that it was done on both sides. Humanity worked towards that reconciliation by building heaven on earth. It was our job to create the social conditions that exist in heaven so that all people could live a life free from the societal ills that cause sin, poverty, war, addiction, ignorance. The idea of using character development to create heaven on earth has its merit. We can be proud of the work that our forebears did to reform prisons hospitals and schools, as well as to promote abolition and women's suffrage. But their zeal for building heaven on earth led them to impose their values on others in ways that are repugnant and exceedingly brutal. And again, this is something for us to unpack another time, but it is important to name that universalists were early supporters of eugenics. And I hope that you picked up on that in the Skinner reading today, and I hope that it made you squirm a little. In their efforts to create heaven on earth, the Universalists created hell for marginalized populations. And it's one thing to take on responsibility for creating heaven on earth, but it's another to attempt to do that by forcing everyone to go along with your idea of what heaven on earth is like using fear and coercion and violence. The 20th century restorationists illustrated some of the shortcomings of universalism. 
One is the arrogance of a belief system that includes all people, places, times, and cultures with no opt-out feature. It was meant as an extension of something that was sweet and lovely, but nobody likes to find out that they are a minor character in somebody else's passion play. And then when Reformation became a part of universalism, that lack of consent became particularly poignant. Now, the second major flaw of universal theology is that it inherently appeals to the privileged. There's a reason it's a woman who's asking what's able to live, really? <laughs> I love universalism, but it is true that this shortcoming exists within it. Those who have suffered mightily at the hands of individuals and institutions and watched their tormentors enjoy long, happy lives of wealth and comfort find it hard to believe that our sins are punished in this lifetime. There's another reason, this is the main reason, that universalism did not catch on with freed slaves. It could not make sense. Universalism has its merits, and I don't think it should be anathema to us but we need to be careful in how we handle this part of our legacy. Parts of it we should keep, and parts of it are a cautionary tale. The parts that we should keep can be traced in the evolution of universalism from Ballou's work in the early 19th century to Skinner's in the early 20th to where we are now as modern Unitarian Universalists. We take from Baloo the belief that we are already saved. And we take from Skinner the belief that we have to work together for collective salvation. Now, I know that that might sound like a contradiction, but as I said before, when we're talking about salvation, we have to ask, saved from what? If we're talking about saved from punishment in an afterlife, <gasps> If we're talking about some traditional concept of, of hell, then yeah, I'm with Blue. We're already saved. There is no hell. But if we're talking about things that keep us from being able to live full, free, healthy lives, I'm with Skinner to a point. And I believe that we do have work to do together to make this world a better place, to build heaven on earth. One of the greatest paradoxes of liberal theology is that we affirm that human beings are beautiful and pure and holy exactly as we are, Baloo, while at the same time we work constantly to transcend certain aspects of human nature. Skinner. And these ideas are some of the most important roots of our religious tradition as Unitarian Universalists. The best thinking of Hosea Ballou and Charles Skinner, along with others, makes us who we are, makes us you you. Our churches are founded on these ideas, and this is where they become lived realities, because this is where we opt in, that we want to be a part of this program of character development. A universalist forebearers, Ballou and Skinner alike, wanted to build heaven on earth, and this, our church, is the place where we do that building. We come here to be reminded of our inherent goodness. This community is where and how we do that character development, and we learn, and we practice, and we hold each other accountable to standards that fit our shared ideas of heaven on earth. And how do we do that? Well, you should know by now that nine times out of ten, the answer to any question about UU churches is covenant. <laughs> You've heard me say time and time again that we are a covenantal religious tradition. We are a covenanted religious community. We are bound to each other by the covenant of this congregation and by the covenant that we call the seven principles. Those two are the blueprints that we use to build our heaven on earth here. 
when we're talking to each other, we are guided by those covenants and we build heaven on earth. When we're expressing our hopes for the church, we do that in a way that reflects those covenants and we build heaven on earth. And I sincerely, to the bottom of my heart, hope that there are no committee meetings in heaven. <laughs> but if there are, that is the way that we should be acting in committee meetings here. When we come together, when we build this beloved community, when we make church together, we can meet each other in radically different ways than we might in the outside world. Here, power and money do not matter. We are all the same. It is not just what we do that is important, it is how we do it. We can be crowds, and we can pull each other down, build hell on earth. I think we've all been to that meeting. Or we can be crawfish, and we can work together for collective salvation everyone who is in this bucket with us and build heaven on earth. If we choose to be crawfish and we use our considerable powers for salvation, it requires patience, perseverance, the discomfort of risk taking. It takes a lot of slow and difficult work to build a chain that will allow our fellow crawfish to climb out. And it takes a lot of patience and faith to know that our fellow crawfish will also help us when our time comes. When we commit to working in that radically different way, we work toward that common destiny that the Universalists envisioned. Even when they got it wrong, this is what they had in mind. And it's our job to get it right. As their descendants, our purpose in being a church is to do something new and bold and holy and different. Building heaven on earth through the way that we treat each other and how we make this church together takes all of us. I don't know what happens when you put both crawfish and crabs in the same bucket, but I imagine it is not pretty. <laughs> Each of us has a role to play in determining what it is like to be a part of Birmingham Unitarian Church. Every single thing that we do in these walls or on behalf of this community contributes to that building or dismantling of our slice of heaven on earth. It is our actions and our choices that bring about heaven or hell right here right now. Let us choose wisely. Let us be motivated first and foremost by kindness. Let us show love, mercy, and grace to one another today, now, and always. May it be so.